All right, ACJ, AJC, I see you, brother. Anthony Cummings, how are you? Good to see you. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay, guys, I'm live. Did you say okay? Sorry about that. I haven't shaved. So you can say I look I look real scrawny. And it doesn't help. I have coffee stained teeth, even though I'm a gorgeous looking man. Evaporate? What do you mean evaporate? I can't remember which one he said. Andrew Martin Bob, yeah. Hello to all. Good to see you guys. It's been a while. If you guys are on my social media pages, meaning Facebook, you'll see that I was just dressed, dressed. I have a lisp, so I have to practice on speaking correctly. You will see I was dressed in a tuxedo this Saturday. One of my best friends got married, signed his life away. And I was all tucked up. I look really dashing, if I say so myself, in my tuxedo. But it's good to see you guys. It's been over a week because I want to share some stuff with you. And we're going to try to get back in the groove of things, trusting that the Spirit will again sanctify me and purify me. Wash us. Wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Purify our loved ones, my daughters, in the holy blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ being our shield cleansing us from our filth, from our flesh. I need it. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. So trusting the Holy Spirit to crucify my flesh and give me grace to walk in the life of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. But just to share with you, every time there's a big event that I'm involved in, whether a debate or a conference or even attending a conference, when I get back, I tend to fall into a mild form of depression, and it takes me a while to regroup. It's just a pattern, right? <clears throat> That's typical. Hey, Tipple, uh, Tipple uh, Tippy Bear, I hate these pal talk names. You guys are going to torture me because some of your names really cause me to go into lisp mode because I have a lisp. So some of your names really hurt my tongue. <laughs> but Tippy Bear. I was listening to part of your response. Excellent job, and I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing by the grace of Jesus Christ. Keep growing in your knowledge of the Bible and your love for Jesus and your zeal to glorify Christ. I just want to make one comment, though. In response to that Muslim, you said John 5.30 refers to Jesus as a man. Tippy Bear, no, that's not true. John 5.30 30, and this is why I'm going to encourage every one of you, and I'm going to sound like a broken record. It is not enough that you read something or listen to something one time. You have to read something and listen to something repetitively over and over again until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. So you can then absorb that information and then use it to glorify Jesus Christ and live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have discussed John 530 over and over again, because that's one of the passages that Muslims often misquote. The answer isn't what you said, Tippy Bear. Jesus wasn't speaking because he was a man and limited. Although he was a man on earth and he experienced genuine human limitations, that's not the point of John 5.30. No, but Tippy Bear, if you go back and listen, don't get defensive, sister. I heard what you said. This is a time to just put down the defense mechanism and listen. You said it's because Jesus was speaking as a man. But then you went to John 1 to show that the same John shows that Jesus is the eternal word. That's not the answer. John 5.30 is not about the humanity of Christ. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't speaking as a man in the flesh on earth. He was. But that's not the point of John 5.30. So if you're going to get defensive to try to justify what you said, then you're never going to learn. You're never going to grow. And I'm trying to help you to be the best you can possibly be for the glory of Jesus, which we all fall short of, right? So are you listening to me now? Now, let me explain to you my point. Let me explain to you what I'm trying to say to Tippy Bear. And pray, guys, we get over 100. Um, I'm working by the grace of God to get the number to 200. Let me just answer John 5.30 real quickly, and by the grace of Jesus, give you some updates, and then we'll go into the topic. 
I was just listening to Zachary Naik because I was bored and had nothing better to do. So I said, hey, why not get a good laugh and listen to this Muslim clown, right? Because he is one of Islam's biggest clowns next to Muhammad. But anyway, let's look at John 5.30 and thank the admins for joining us. And thank Protestant Believer for help me, helping me to help you glorify Jesus Christ. John 5.30, here's the passage. And by the way, Tippy Bear, who are you responding to? John 5.30, let's read it. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Muslims often quote this passage to prove that Jesus is a finite, limited creature who's nothing but a servant of God who can only do what God commands him. That's John chapter 5, verse 30. Do you see that passage? Now, Tippy Bear, who are you responding to in that video? I'm just curious, so I can explain to you what it means. Okay. Oh, his name is Abdul Uzza? Well, no, it can't be Abdul Uzza. Uzza is a pagan goddess. I know you're mocking him. But does he have a name? Is it Behold Islam's Dog? There's a guy who calls himself Behold, Behold the Guard or something. Really, his name is Behold Islam's Dog. I don't mean to insult dogs. Right? Anyway, dogs are cleaner than him. Anyway, with that said, John 5.30. Here's how not to answer that passage. Shana Saruch sandwich. Here's how not to answer that passage. I know Christians will say, but Jesus is speaking as a man here. No, that's not the answer. Okay. Are you ready? And by the way, why I'm saying this is because I did an entire session on the context of John 5.30, not too long ago, right? But this, again, reminds every one of you, spend less time studying Islam, more time studying the Bible, asking the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible and give you the power to live out the Bible as an expression of your love for Jesus because we, we need to love Jesus more. We don't love him enough and we fail him. And may the Lord Jesus have mercy and forgive us and cover us by his precious blood and fill us with the Spirit and anoint this session in the power of the Holy Spirit and enable me to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus. Recall the passages and then give us the zealous, passionate love of, from the Holy Spirit to be zealous to live out the truth for the glory of Jesus. We need you, Lord Jesus. Please save us from our flesh, from the world, from Satan and our loved ones, my precious daughters. Anoint this session. Anoint us and fill me for your glory. We love you, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, please, when we fail you. Please, Lord, have mercy on us and be patient with us in Jesus' name. I didn't want to pray before I begin. Okay, John 5.30, let's look at it one more time, and I need your attention because I want you to focus on how to answer this passage, John 5.30. And folks, do me a favor, focus on the topic, no side talks, let's not go on tangents, because if you're more involved in the text, you won't focus on the exegesis, and if you're not focusing on the exegesis, you won't learn how to interpret the Bible correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? John 5.30. Let's read. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So you see? He's just a creature. He can't do anything except what God orders him to do. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. But real quickly, if a Muslim quotes this, to try to prove that Jesus is just a human messenger, turn it against the Muslim in the following manner. Pay attention because I'm going to teach you how to interpret the scriptures as the Holy Spirit teaches me and enables me to teach you for the glory of Christ and how to turn these objections against the Muslim. You ready? You ready for the answer? Okay. Number one, this passage ends up proving too much. It proves that Jesus could not be a Muslim and Muhammad was a false prophet and an antichrist. Why? Because notice the last part of the verse. Notice the last part of the verse. <clears throat> I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. The God that Jesus obeys is the Father, specifically the Father of Jesus Christ. But according to the Quran, Allah is a father to no one, and he's definitely not the Father of Jesus Christ. Now, write down the passages. We won't look at them. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. 
Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Just write these down. We're not going to look at them. Chapter 6, verse 101 of the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 101 of the Quran. Chapter 9, verse 30, where we're clearly told that if you say that the Messiah is the Son of Allah, Allah will fight you. Chapter 9, verse 30. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93. Chapter 21, verse 26. Chapter 21, verse 26. These are all Quranic passages. Note them, write them down, right? <clears throat> chapter 39, verse 4, and chapter 72, <clears throat> verse, verse 3. 72, verse 3. As the Lord Jesus enables me to recall this information correctly and saves me from error. Okay. All of these passages teach Allah has no children. He's a father to no one. And not simply in a biological procreative manner. We would agree with the Muslims to say that God sires children biologically, physically, sexually is a blasphemy. That's Mormonism. But the Quran even denies the metaphorical or the spiritual <clears throat> aspect of God's fatherhood. In other words, it even denies that God is a father spiritually who has children spiritually. Okay. So John 5.30, right off the bat, proves that Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist, and his God is not the God that Jesus came to obey and to accomplish his will perfectly. You're right? So right off the bat, John 5.30 exposes Islam as a sham. But what was Jesus saying in context? So Christians, let me repeat, never say John 5.30 is talking about Jesus' humanity, that Jesus as a man, he's speaking as a man. That's not the answer of John 5.30. The reason why Tippi Bear and others say that is because they're being lazy. And I'm going to be honest, you were being lazy, Tippi. Do you know why? Because you didn't bother to read the verses that came before to see what the point was. Are we ready to break this down? And by the way, this directly relates to Zakir Naik, Islam's clown, one of the biggest clowns of Islam, next to the prophet of Islam, because he too quotes John 5.30. So we're going to kill several birds with one stone. As I deal with John 5.30, I'll not only be refuting, behold, Islam's dog, behold the guardian, the guardian of, of hell, <clears throat> but I'll be refuting Zakir Naik, a world-class tap dancer, and Muslim clown, and Shabir Ali and others, okay? So now let's see what Jesus was saying in context. Are we ready? Are we ready? Let's start it. Now, again, the context is Jesus heals a paralytic. He heals someone who's paralyzed, and he heals them on the Sabbath day. He heals them on the Sabbath day. Instead of being astounded by the miracle that Jesus performed, the Jews got upset. They were irate that he did this on the Sabbath, telling the man to pick up his mat, telling the man to do what they considered to be work on the Sabbath, to pick up his mat, which they got angry with him. Why are you picking up your mat? That's work, and you're not to work on the Sabbath. And he says, well, Jesus told me. The one who healed me told me to pick up my mat and go home. So they got upset. Uh, Brainiac, I don't know if you can ask a question. And if your question is silly, I will block you and send you on your merry way. So they got upset. Why are you doing what is considered work on the Sabbath that's unlawful? And he says, well, Jesus told me. Now, let's pick it up in John 5. We're going to read 16 to 18. John 5, verses 16 to 18. What's up, Alan? Good to see you, man. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh, hit her too. Old English. He's going to kill my lisp. My father is working till this day, and I work. And I work. Notice what he's saying. My father is working even on the Sabbath. My father is working even on the Sabbath, and I am working also. Now, notice their reaction to what Jesus said, and I'll unpack it to bring out the implication of Jesus' words, showing that the Jews correctly understood the implication, but at the same time misunderstood 
what Jesus was actually saying about his relationship to the Father. Let's unpack it. Notice their reaction in verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now, why in the world did the Jews reason that Jesus was making himself equal to God, his Father? Because of what he said in 17. He's saying, my Father, who is God, is exempt from Sabbath regulations. My Father, who is God, is exempt from Sabbath restrictions. In other words, you Jews are under the law and subject to the Sabbath restrictions and regulations, not God. God must work even on the Sabbath because if he's not working, then who will sustain creation? If God remains inactive on the Sabbath, there goes creation. So God cannot stop actively working every day, every second of every minute of every hour of every day because he needs to be actively working to sustain all life all the time. So the Jews would agree. God does work on the Sabbath because he, he performs the work of preserving life, of sustaining creation. So he never takes a break. And God doesn't need to take a break because he doesn't get tired. But then Jesus says, likewise, I am working. That's where they got upset because they understood that he's claiming that as the son, he too has the same right to work on the Sabbath. And like the father, he's exempt from the Sabbath law. You see why? See, the Jews weren't st stupid. These Jewish scholars were brilliant and very meticulous in the way they interpreted the Hebrew Bible. And they could see what Jesus was saying. You with me there? You understand? They could see, wait, wait, wait. We know God is exempt from Sabbath restrictions. And we know God, by necessity, has to work on the Sabbath to preserve the Sabbath. I mean, preserve creation. Who do you think you are to say that like God the Father, you too have the same authority to work on the Sabbath, and like the Father, you're exempt from the Sabbath regulations? Who do you think you are? You caught it? You understand the implication? I want to make sure you got it. Because now we're going to continue the discussion. Uh, Robert Davidson, if you're asking me a question to challenge me, you know I'm going to block you, right? You know I'm going to block you. What does Mark 2.28, Mark 2.27 specifically, have to do with my exegesis of John chapter 5? Why are you bringing Mark 2.27, which has no bearing on the exegesis of John chapter 5? You think it does, but it doesn't. Okay, this is what again upsets me when some people think they know scripture. So they quote a passage of scripture that they think somehow poses a problem to my exegesis or a challenge when in reality only exposes their biblical illiteracy. That's all it does. And I will cure you of your biblical literacy by the grace of God's spirit in a minute when we revisit or go back to Mark 2.27. But keep it up and I'm going to send you on your merry way. Right, But let's focus now. Now let's see Jesus' response in John chapter 5, verse 19. Yep, Bill Thompson. John chapter 5, verse 19. Pay attention because I already did a session on this. And if I have to do more sessions on this, I will. But I want you to understand, right? Okay? And focus so that you can learn the material, you can learn the argument and use it in your witness so that more people can teach these truths to reach even more people. If there are more of us who understand these arguments, that means we can reach more people for the glory of the triune God. Okay, now John 5, 19, here is Jesus' answer. Here is Jesus' answer. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. The same point he made in verse 30. So if I stop there, it implies... Jesus is claiming to be a finite creature. But no, finish it. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever, whatever he doeth, the Father does. 
These also do it the son likewise. Did you catch what he just said? The son cannot do a single thing on his own initiative. He can only do what he sees the father doing. And everything the father does, the son does in the same manner. That sounds like a man to you? Really? Yep, like, hit that like button and subscribe. Does that sound like a man to you? Can a man say, I can only do what God does, and everything God does, I do it in the same way? If he's a mere man, that's blasphemy, because human creatures do a lot of things that God wouldn't do, and no human creature can do everything that God does in the way that God does it. So why Tippy Bear? No, Tippy Bear, you did not say that. See, there you go, being defensive, sister. And I really don't like when people try to defend themselves when they're corrected. That's not what you said. I heard you carefully. You said John 5.30, it's the man speaking. Jesus is a man. And you ran to John 1 to show that the same John says he's God. No, sister, that's not what you're saying. Be humble enough to accept correction because this way, in your pride, you're not going to learn. That's not what you said. It's okay to be wrong and be corrected. There's no shame. That's not what you said. You said, it's the man. Jesus says, the man is speaking. And you ran to John 1. You didn't bother to deal with the context of John 5. Right? No, yeah. Well, hopefully. This is for your benefit. Folks, let me tell you something. I know we're human. We don't like to be corrected because we have pride issues, every one of us, some more than others. And I'm guilty of that. May God save us from our flesh. But if you're going to be defensive and not accept correction, you will not benefit. You won't learn. There is no shame in learning and being corrected. Okay. So when you get defensive, when you get defensive, that's telling me that the flesh is kicking in and you're feeling your pride being stung. And then you're going to justify when simply die to the flesh. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Right? Say, so Christian, I, I can't wait to see you so I can be harsh on you and stone you and repent for it. Right? But now, do you understand in John 5, 19, let's look at it again because we're going to unpack the context. John 5, 19. That's why I love Medic for Christ. He allows me to take shots at him in a spirit of love when I said, you suck, and he sucks lemons, right? And he doesn't get upset. He just becomes better. Okay, John 5, 19. John 5, 19. One more time. Then answer Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I said to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Do you want to see a very powerful translation? Right? Yes, I will debate that pussycat hijab, and I will <clears throat> make sure to muzzle him with his niqab. Tell the coward to debate me, and you come with him, and make sure you get out of your wife's mirt, like your prophet was known to be dressed in your wife's mirt, so I can muzzle both of you guys with your niqabs. Okay, send this guy back to the Blackstone to smooch it. All right. Okay, let's focus here. You want to see a powerful translation of John 5, 19? Protestant believer. Post the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. John 5, 19 in the Jehovah's Witness Translation. Watch here. You want to see how powerful this rendering, this verse is in the Jehovah's Witness Translation? Look how the Jehovah's Witnesses render it. Look how the Jehovah's Witnesses render it. Look at the Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Tell me this is not powerful. Look. Therefore, in response, Jesus said to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son does also in like manner. Wow! The Son cannot do a single thing on his own initiative. Their translation brings out the fact that it was impossible for Jesus to sin. Brainiac, you need to leave, buddy. Block Brainiac to never come back to my channel. He needs to get out of here. Send him out of here. Okay? He's He cannot do a single thing on his own initiative, meaning that Jesus could not sin. This also refutes the belief of some Christians that say that, say that Jesus could have sinned as a man but chose not to. No. John 5.19 shows 
even as a man, Jesus could not sin. It was impossible for him to sin because he could only do what the Father does. So if he could sin, that means the Father could sin also. You want me there? So if Jesus could sin, so could the Father. Because Jesus says, I cannot do a single thing on my own initiative. I can only do what the Father does and what the Father commands me. So if the Father can sin, so could Jesus. But if the Father cannot sin, Jesus couldn't sin either, even as a man on earth. Clear? Clear? Now, let me ask you the question so we can unpack the rest of the chapter. Let me ask you a question so we can unpack the rest of the chapter. Okay. What creature could say, pay attention, what creature could say, I can only do what God does, no more, no less, and everything God does, I can do in the same way he does them. So why would we think, John 5.30 is all about the humanity of Jesus. Where do we get that from? It's all about the perfect, inseparable unity of the Godhead and an explicit affirmation that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father, but different from him in person. John 5 is one of the most powerful chapters articulating, explaining what the Trinity is. The Trinity teaches that the distinct persons, these three eternal relationships, are inseparable. They can never act apart from the other. They can never act independently from the other. They can only work in perfect union with the other. And they can do what the others do in the same way that the others do them because all of them are God. That's what John 5 is teaching. So why would we say, as Tippy Bear and others often do, oh, Jesus is speaking as a man. No, he's not. As the incarnate son, the son who is a man, who is flesh, he's affirming, I cannot act independently from the father because I'm inseparably united to him. I'm bound up to him. And because I'm distinct from him, I can look to him and see what he does and do everything he does in the same way he does them because we're not the same person, but we're not separate beings, separate gods. Jesus never worked apart from the Father on earth before he came to earth and now that he's in heaven. Never. They always work in perfect union. Let me show you. Jesus saying the same thing about the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13. And the Holy Spirit did not become a man, did not become flesh. So you can't say it's the Holy Spirit speaking as a man because he never became man, never became human, never became flesh. John 16, 13. Okay. However, when that one comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak of his own initiative. But what he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things to come. Same thing said about the Holy Spirit, folks. So are you telling me the Holy Spirit is also a man? He became a flesh and blood human being? Of course not. Only Jesus became man. But Jesus says the same thing about the Spirit. The Spirit will not speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak to you, reveal to you what he hears from the Father and the Son because that's the nature of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit always work in perfect union, can never work independently and separately from the others. That does not exist in the Godhead. That's why it's one God, but more than one person. We got distractions of the children of Satan. Send them on their merry way. But it gets better. John 5, 20 to 21. It gets better. It's going to get a lot better, folks. So please, after today's exegesis of John 5, I have articles on this. I've done sessions on this. Please do not repeat that Jesus is speaking as a man. 
Please. John 5, 20 to 21. For the Father has affection for... We're still using the Jehovah's Witness Bible to show you how their own Bible refutes them. For the Father has affection for the Son. And I'll explain to you why they translated the word affection, whereas in the King James, it's love, right? And shows him all the things he himself does, and he will show him works greater than these so that you may marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead, dead up and makes them alive, so the Son also makes alive whoever he wants to. You catch it? Whatever he does, I do. The Father raises the dead, I raise the dead. He gives life, I give life. And I can do whatever he does, and I can only do what he does. And you're telling me this is a passage that proves that Jesus isn't God? Seriously? You're telling me this is a passage that proves Jesus isn't God? Are you serious? You're kidding me, right? That tells me you have not read the context. And sadly, neither have Christians, because anytime a Christian tells me, oh, that's Jesus speaking as a man with human limitation, that Christian shows that he or she hasn't read the context either. Right? Now, we're going to skip, and we're going to read John 5, 25 and 28, 29 together. And I'll come back to John 5 again. John 5, verse 25 and 28, 29 together. Alan Rule, John 5 is one of the most powerful chapters affirming the perfect unity of the Godhead, affirming Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father, yet one with him in essence, deserving of the same glory, if you know how to unpack it. If you know how to unpack it. Now read with me. John 5, 25, 28 to 29. And we're going to now use the Quran to prove that Jesus claimed to be God. But pay attention. I'm now going to bring in the Quran. Watch here. Verily, verily, I send to you, the hour is coming. Pay attention. Hour is coming. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So here Jesus saying that he will give spiritual life because he says the hour has now come where people will hear me and they will live. Here he means spiritually. He will give them spiritual life. But then jump to 28, 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. 25 tells you whose voice. The voice of the Son of God. You can't escape it. The voice of the Son of God. Those are in their graves and their tombs at that hour will hear the voice of the Son of God and shall come forth. They that have done good unto, <clears throat> sorry, unto, let me find the passage again. Unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. So now, let's unpack it. Jesus Christ says that by the sound of his voice, because 25 says the voice of the Son of God. Can't escape it. The voice of the Son of God. He will give some spiritual life. And then at the hour of judgment, by the power of his voice, he will then raise the dead physically to life to stand in judgment. Did you catch it? Yeah, you see that just what Jesus said? Uh, Karim, don't talk about paganism because your prophet was a pagan pedophile who smooched the black stone. Send this guy to Mecca. Okay, did you guys catch it? Everyone caught. Jesus says at the hour... He, by the power of his voice, will give spiritual life to believers and then physical life to those who are in their graves. He will raise them out of their graves at the hour. And he will do it by his voice, the voice of the Son of God. Everyone caught it? It's Kareem Khalifa. Thank you, our church. I need to be blessed. I need to be filled with the Spirit. I need to walk in purity. I need to crucify my flesh, be filled with love for Jesus, and live for him. And even be willing to die for him. I need to. I fail. Okay, now if you caught it, if you caught it, we're going to go to the Quran in a minute. Let's go to John 6, 39 to 40. If you caught it. John 6, 39 to 40. If you caught it. Because wait, what's going to happen? So that's why you see I said Zechar Naik is a clown, world-class clown next to Muhammad. Jesus speaking again. Jesus speaking. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, 
that all of which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at, at the last day. Wow. Jesus says at the last day, the day of judgment, the day of resurrection, he will raise up all believers, immortal and glorious. He will do it. And then 40, he re reiterates it. Verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, if you look to the Son and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 54. Wait, it's going to get better. John 6, 54. Watch here. Bear with me because I want to unpack John 5 and we'll be done with it. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I, Jesus, will raise him up at the last day. The hour is coming, and it is now, when the, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. The hour is coming where all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Right? Right? Jesus is going to do right. Now notice John, John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Watch here. Yep, by the grace of God, we're growing. We pray I keep growing. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, guys, get ready to be blown away. Get ready to turn John 5 against Muslims, proving that Jesus claimed to be the God of Muhammad. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life. I am the source of all life. Biological life comes from me. Spiritual life comes from me. Everlasting, immortal life comes from me, right? From me, in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I am the truth. The hour is coming where the dead who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and come out. And at the last day, I will raise them up. Okay, now, chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran. Protestant, are you able to quote it? Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. Pay attention now. Pay attention. Seven Psalms. Are you aware that that Greek word for na doesn't mean in that context to physically na his flesh because you don't do that either? So seven Psalms. Pay attention to the subject. Don't turn this into a Catholic lesson. Anyway, chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran. Let's see if you guys caught it. This is because Allah is the truth and because he gives life to the dead and because he has power over all things and because the hour is coming, there's no doubt about it because Allah shall raise up those who are in the graves. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why is Allah sounding like Jesus in, in John's gospel? Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7, Allah is the truth. He gives life to the dead and it says at the hour... Allah will raise those who are in the graves. Everything Jesus just said in John chapter 5. Let's look at it again. John 5, 21. John 5, 25. John 5, 28 to 29. John 5, verse 21, verse 25, and verses 28 to 29. Let's look at it again. Marcus possibly it could have been. But that's another topic for another time. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. Quickeneth is the old English way of saying gives them life. Even so the Son quickeneth, gives life whom he will. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth. Wait, 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 wait. The Quran just said, Allah is the truth. Allah gives life to the dead. And at the hour, Allah will raise them out of their graves. Jesus said, I, the Son of God, am the truth and I'm the life. And like the Father, I, the Son, give life to the dead, give life to whom I want. And at the hour, the dead in their graves will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and come out. Jesus, who do you think you are? Do you understand now why I said 
Do not say that in John 5.30, Jesus is speaking as a man in his human limitations. That's not the contextual meaning of John 5.30. Because John 5.30 follows John 5, 28, 29. Let's look at John 5, 28 to 30 to see. Is Jesus speaking as a man or is he speaking as the divine son who is inseparable from the father, who is in perfect union with the father and can never act apart from the father, but in, but in perfect union with the father? Let's see if what Jesus is saying. When we look at John 5, 30 in light of 28, 29. Okay, marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the res resurrection of damnation. And now verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing. I can of my own self do nothing. And now verse 30, okay, as I hear I judge and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So how in the world are you going to take verse 30 to prove that Jesus is claiming to be a human creature, a finite, limited human messenger, when in the context he's teaching the opposite? I am the divine son who is different from the Father, but inseparable from him and can only act in perfect harmony with him. And because I am God like the Father is, I can do whatever the Father does in the same way that the Father does it, which is why the Father trusts me enough to raise the dead and make them immortal. Right? Did you catch it now or no? I want it to sink in. I'm giving you a couple minutes for it to sink in. So anytime, anytime I hear a Christian saying in John 5.30, Jesus is speaking as a man, that tells me that Christian has not studied the context. That's not what Jesus is saying. Yes, he is a man when he said these words, but he's trying to explain to the Jews the reason why I'm working on the Sabbath is because my father told me to work on the Sabbath. Why would my father have me work on the Sabbath? Because like the father, I have the power to do everything the father does in the same way that he does it. And because I'm one with him, I, like the father, am exempt from the Sabbath regulations because I, like the father, own the Sabbath. I'm not subject to the Sabbath. So your rules don't apply to me any more than they apply to the Father. You understand what he's saying? Your rules don't apply to me any more than they apply to the Father. If you're saying I can't work on the Sabbath, that means my Father can't work on the Sabbath. But obviously my Father can work on the Sabbath and I can work with him because I'm his son who's one with him, who owns the Sabbath along with him and can do whatever he does on the same day that he does it. Right? Are you catching it, guys? Is it making sense? There are a few more things I want to look at. John 5, we can go into other things. Uh, I would tell that Muslim sort of truth. The very passage you cite, it proves that Jesus is not a creature and that Muhammad is a false prophet. And I'll show you. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have a Islamic day today. We're going to take the typical passages that Zekir, a.k.a. Clown Naik, and his cohorts use and turn it against them. But now let's look at John 5, 22 to 23. John 5, 22 to 23. Yep, hit the like button. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now why? Why? Why has the Father appointed the Son to judge everyone? Here, here's why. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which sent him. Now, this too would be blasphemous if Jesus is a man. Jesus is saying, my Father wants me to determine the fate of every creature. He has me judging everyone and determining their everlasting destiny, 
Why? Because my father wants people to realize who I am so that they can honor me the way they honor the father. Do you see what he just said? Do you see what he just said? The reason why my father wants me to be the judge is because he wants mankind to know that their everlasting destiny is in my hands. Their faith is in my hands. I determine where they will live after they die and what will happen to them. Now, why does my father want me to determine the destiny of every creature? So that every creature realizes that they depend on me and need me and must honor me the way they honor the father. Now, notice what he did not say. He did not say, honor me as you honor a prophet. Honor me the way you honor your parents. He says, no, my father himself wants you to give me the same honor you give him. Wait, wait, wait. But Jesus, the father is God and I'm to honor him as God, meaning I sing to him. I pray to him. I love him more than anything, more than my children, more than my family, more than my earthly life, more than my possessions. I need to be willing to give all of that up, even die for God. And that's the love I'm supposed to give to God alone, no one else. And yet here you're telling me the Father wants me to give you that same honor, meaning the Father wants me to sing to you as well, pray to you as well, <clears throat> love you more than my own life, be willing to die for you love, you, love you more than my children, more than anything. The Father wants me to give you that same honor. But why would the Father want me to do that if you're a creature? That would be idolatry, Jesus. You got it, not a verse. Yep, Grung, he was claiming divinity because it is only in the sovereign name of God Almighty that you perform miracles. You cannot invoke the name of someone else. You got it there? You see it? You count what he just said, right? My father demands that you honor me the way you honor him. Now, we believe the same John that wrote the Gospel of John wrote Revelation. So now let me show you that according to the God-breathed scriptures, the day will come where God's desire will be realized. The day will come where God's desire that everyone honors the Son the same way they honor Him will be realized voluntarily or involuntarily. It will happen because God Almighty will make sure it will happen. Now let me show you John seeing the fulfillment of this. John seeing God's desire that every creature, not just humans, honor the Son the same way they honor the Father will be realized. He saw it as a realized fact as a reality he was seeing the future taking place before his eyes revelation 5 verse 13 revelation 5 verse 13 watch here yep air church you better do so revelation 5 13 and every now pay attention because i'm going to blow you guys away Every creature, and you guys know this because I've mentioned this in the past. So I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every creature, in case you didn't catch it, John exhausts the language, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. Every creature, everywhere. John exhausts the language for you to get the point. Meaning that John is also seeing himself in that company. Because God is able to show, show you a vision that includes you in the vision while you're seeing yourself as part of that group. So you see what's happening here? John is seeing a reality that will take place in the future being realized before his eyes. A reality that includes him as one of the participants. Let me give you a very bad example of what I mean. Have you seen the, the movie Scrooge? Where Scrooge is shown himself, where he sees himself as a young man and as an old man, right? You get my point? When I'm, so 
what I'm trying to say here is that when John sees every creature in all creation, he is seeing himself as well as part of that company that's doing the following. Revelation 5, 13. One more time. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, every creature everywhere, all that are in them, I heard I saying, saying, blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. John, what in the world are you seeing? How can you see every creature that's been created, every creature in the entire creation on one side and the lamb separate and distinguished from the entire creation, placed on the side of God the Father, being given the exact same worship to the same degree and for the same duration that the Father receives if Jesus is just a creature. Right? Did you catch what you just read in Revelation 5.13? The Father's desire being realized. The Father's desire that everyone give his son the same honor he receives being realized. A reality that John sees being realized before his eyes by the Spirit. Yes, because Christian for Christ, you didn't pay attention again. It said every creature. Now prove to me the Spirit is a creature. Every creature. How can that include the spirit when it says every creature, such as Hater Wood, who perfected the art of hating and started Hater Aid? He too, this hater, this white supremacist dictator, he too will be worshiping God and the Lamb. Okay, so one more time. Revelation 5.13. I'm catching up to you, Hater Wood. I'm over 200 and growing by the grace of the triune God. Let's look at Revelation 5.13 one more time. Okay. One more time because I want to answer this question. Exactly, you can. You can't even spell. And every creature. So to answer your question, who told you this includes the spirit when the spirit of God is not a creature? You caught it there? Who told you the spirit would be included when the context is about every created thing and the Holy Spirit is not a creature. He's the eternal spirit of the Father and the Son. Hebrews 9, 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Unlike David Wood, I don't want to just attract anyone. I want to attract people who are sincere students of the word, who want to learn and grow and love Jesus. This hater will accept anyone, right? Just to make his channel blow up. Anyway, Hebrews 9, 14, let's read it. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself. Did you guys catch it? The eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. One more time, post Hebrews 9, 14. Love you too, growing. Hebrews 9, 14. One more time. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Is it a coincidence that only three and three alone are not creatures? are eternal, separate from every created thing in existence, God, the Lamb, and the Spirit? You see why we're Trinitarians? You see why we're Trinitarians? Revelation 5.13, God and the Lamb, separated, distinguished from every creature in existence. And Hebrews 9.14 says the Spirit is the eternal Spirit. Do the math, folks. God, the Lamb, eternal Spirit, three and only three, no wonder we're Trinitarians. 
But did you see that Hebrews 9.14 is a Trinitarian passage? Do you see again how the Trinity always work in perfect union? Did you see it says Jesus offered himself to God the Father in union with the eternal spirit. So the Godhead working together and bringing about the redemption of the people of God. Christ our sacrifice and high priest who offered himself by the eternal spirit working with him aiding him, assisting him to present a sacrifice without blemish to God the Father. That, folks, is the Trinity in action, Hebrews 9, 14, a Trinitarian passage showing that the work of redemption is a Trinitarian work. Trinitarian work. Yes, Dan Bitzel. All throughout Revelation, the Holy Spirit is active. He's in the Spirit. Being empowered by the Spirit to receive revelations from God. Being transported in heaven to see visions of heaven by the Spirit. And the Spirit speaks in revelation. Not simply binatarians, Octavian. Trinitarians, because the Spirit is included as being separate from creation. Eternal by nature. Working together with the Father and Son in perfect union. Making sense to everyone? Did you catch it? Say what again? I've said a lot again. The Holy Spirit is distinguished from every created thing in that he's said to be eternal by nature, one with the Father and the Son, working in perfect union with them, and bringing about creation, redemption, sanctification, and glorification. One is the code word for yes, Sister Spooky. Two is the code word for no. I'm weird like that. I don't know why. I came up with my own method of communicating. But now let me show you the Trinity again. Let's go to John 5.21. Let's go to John 5.21. Let's just look at the Trinity now. Are you ready? Three and only three are described as being God in an absolute sense, possessing the unique characteristics, abilities of God. Three and only three. Three and only three. Let's prove it. John 5, 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. So who gives life? Quickeneth is the old English way of saying give life. The Father gives life to the dead. Even so, the Son quickeneth whom he will. So the Father and the Son give life to the dead. Do you see it there? In John 5, 21? In that passage, how many persons give life to the dead? How many persons are able to give life? Two, right? Father and the Son. But then John 6, 63. John 6, 63. John 6, 63. Watch here. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Okay, Jesus, I'm confused. In the previous chapter, you said the Father and you, the Son, quickeneth, give life to the dead. But now you're saying the spirit quickeneth also. The spirit quickeneth. The spirit gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, guys, is it a coincidence that three and only three are said to give life in all its various forms? The Father gives life to the dead, the Son gives life to the dead, and the Spirit gives life to the dead. And you won't find a fourth person giving life to the dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Do you see why the church was forced? By the God be scriptures to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Whoa. Paul, the Spirit gives life? Yeah. Jesus, the Spirit quickeneth, gives life? Yes. But so does the Father? Yes. So does the Son? Yes. And only these three, there's not a fourth. No, there's no fourth. Oh, no wonder we are Trinitarians. Hmm. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, seven Psalms. Nicaea came from the Orthodox Church, which broke away from the Catholic Church in 1054, because the Orthodox say that your Pope became corrupted, and Pope Francis is an argument for the corruption of your church. Seven Psalms. Stop trying to proselytize us to the Roman Catholic Church. You're going to embarrass yourself. Okay? 1 Timothy 6, 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. Wait, who gives light to everything? God. Meaning God the Father here. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. But then wait, let's go to Acts 17, 25. Pedro, all glory to the triumph God, all glory and praise and honor to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who empowers me to recall passages, and I trust the Spirit enables me to interpret them correctly. That's the gift of His grace. He gets the glory, the triumph God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Acts 17, 25. Acts 17, 25. 17, 25, sinner, not five. Acts 17, 25. Neither is worshipped with men's hand as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth life to all. This is talking about God who sent Jesus, God the Father. He gives life to all and breath and all things. Okay, so God, meaning God the Father, quickeneth the dead, gives life to all. The Son gives life, he quickeneth the dead, and the Spirit gives life. Interesting. Interesting. So will we ever make the mistake of saying that John 5.30 is speaking of Jesus in his humanity and his human limitations. So hopefully Tippy Bear will not repeat that again. None of you will repeat that again. You will not make the mistake of saying, John 5.30, Jesus speaking as a man. No. Yes, he's a man when he says those words, but that's not the point of the context. The point of the context is, that he's the divine son who became flesh, the divine son who's different from the father in person, but equal to the father in power, in ability, in glory, in essence, in majesty, and inseparable from him because being the son who's one with the father in essence, he can only work in perfect union. He cannot act independently. Why do you think we emphasize that God is one? These passages show us they must be one in essence in their mode of existence, meaning their being, though they're different persons, different relationships, because if they were independent beings, so they could act independently. If they were separate beings, they would be separate gods who could act independently. But Jesus is telling you, no, I can't act independently from him. Neither can the spirit act independently from me and the father. Because though we are different persons and different relationships, we are all one God, possessing the same essence, sharing the same being, eternally, immutably. You caught it? So are we done with John 5? I mean, we're okay with John 5 now? Do I need to repeat, or did you get the point of John 5 so I don't have to repeat this again? Now let's go to that canard of Mark 2.27. Mark 2.27, because someone brought it up saying, well, what didn't Jesus say that Sabbath was made for man, man, not for Sabbath? Well, let me explain what it does and does it mean. See, Medic, again, you asked me a question that I've answered in the past. I don't know if you've even listened to my discussion because, again, you're using a term separate in fellowship from the Father and the Spirit in a different sense from what I was from what I was saying now. So I don't know if you've heard my answer. If you haven't, I'll answer it. If you have, then you're wasting my time. Okay. Mark 2.27. Daniel Bitzel, please do not use Acts 5 to prove the Holy Spirit is called God. Acts 5 is one of the worst passages to use to prove your point. What I want to encourage you, Dan Bitzel, to do is do not simply parrot or repeat what you hear from your pastor or theologians and apologists 
But ask the Holy Spirit to dig deeper, reflect on what you hear, and test all things. Everything you hear from anyone, myself. Be a Berean, Acts 17, 11, And do what 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says. Test all things. Hold to that which is good. Why? Because you're repeating a passage that people often quote to prove that the Holy Spirit is called God and it doesn't do any such thing. Acts 5 does not show the Holy Spirit is called God. One of the worst examples to prove the deity of the Holy Spirit. No. Now let me tell you why you shouldn't use Acts 5. And pray God keep me humble and crucify my flesh because the wisdom and knowledge that I have is the gift of his grace. I don't deserve. He's given it to me to share it with you. But one thing the Holy Spirit has taught me is to think critically, not simply parrot what I hear. Think critically to make sure what I'm hearing is sound. And I want to pass that on to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I hear people often quoting Acts 5 verse 3 to 4 to say, see, Holy Spirit is God. And they don't realize they just buried themselves because you end up proving the apostles are God too. Did you know that, Dan, you just proved that Peter is God in the flesh? Did you know that? You guys want me to show you how? Yes, I can, Carl, if you just be patient. Corgliss, I can. That's very easy to explain. I will. You want me to show you how John Acts 5 proves that the, uh, Peter and the apostles are God in the flesh? They're the Holy Spirit in the flesh? Okay, let's, let's begin. Pay attention now so you don't use this passage to prove something it doesn't prove. Are you ready? Sort of truth. Don't let the Mohammedans distract you because they're used of the devil. Pay attention. Focus on the glory of the triune God. Acts 5, verses 3 to 4. Let's look at it. Let me show you, please. If I explain a passage and then I go ahead and I hear you guys use an argument that I told you not to use and the way you're using it, then that tells me you're wasting my time. You're not listening. I'll block you because I don't want to waste my time on people who are not learning. I'm just being honest here. Don't waste my time. I won't waste yours. Okay. Acts 5 verses 3 to 4. And Ananias lied to Peter. Now watch what he says. Pay attention. And Elias lied to Peter and the other apostles. Pay attention. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath God, why hath <clears throat> may the Father, Son, and Spirit save me from error and blasphemy and crucify my flesh, cover us by the blood of Jesus, save us, Lord. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Okay, let's unpack it. Number one, folks, did Ananias lie to the apostles like Peter who were men? Did he lie to the apostles like Peter who were men? But notice what Peter said. What, what do you mean, Angela? No. Who was he lying to? A ghost? Casper the ghost? Let's try this again. Did Ananias lie to the apostles who were men, who were human. Of course, the context, folks, the context is he lied to the apostles. Were they human? Were they men? Yes. But notice he said, you did not lie to men, to God. So Peter is saying, lying to us is lying to God. Lying to us is lying to the Holy Spirit. Well, if this means that the Holy Spirit is God, it also means that Peter is God. Because notice the logic. You lied to me, Ananias. But you know when you lied to me, you're lying to God. And you know when you're lying to me, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. So if lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God, and that somehow makes the Holy Spirit God, then that means Peter is God. Because notice, lying to Peter is to lie to God. So if that makes the Holy Spirit God, because when you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God, by the same logic, it makes Peter God, because Peter says, when you lie to me, you lie to God as well. You see the problem with using this to prove the Holy Spirit is God? It proves too much. All Peter is saying is, because I speak on behalf of God, you're not just lying to me, you're lying to God whom I represent. 
Likewise, since it's the Spirit speaking through me, when you lie to me, you're lying to the Spirit who's using me. And if you're lying to the Spirit, you're lying to God who sent the Spirit. This does not prove the Holy Spirit is God. Stop using it to prove the Holy Spirit is God. Because you end up proving Peter is God. You understand the logic? Let me repeat it one more time. The argument is, see, Ananias liked the Holy Spirit. And in lying to the Holy Spirit, he lied to God. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. But wait, the context is Ananias was lying to Peter. So if I apply that logic, lying to the Holy Spirit is the same as lying to God. That makes the Holy Spirit God. Well, that means lying to Peter affirms that Peter must be God because in lying to Peter, you're lying to God also. You see the problem? No, Bob did not answer it already. There's no way to answer without proving that Peter is God. Pedro, I challenge you to give me Bob's argument to see if he answered it. Only in your wishful thinking. Proof to me, answered it. Let's see. Shoot your best shot. Watch how I shut it down. <clears throat> but let me tell you how you can use Acts 5, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> Do you want to see the proper use of Acts 5, verses 3 and 4? I, Orthodox Christian, I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you what passage to use. Acts 5, verses 3 to 4, you don't use to prove the Holy Spirit is God. Acts 5, verses 3 and 4, you use to prove the Holy Spirit is a person. Why? Because notice that Peter says, Ananias lied to him. And in lying to him, he lied to God. And in lying to him, he also lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, it makes sense to say that you lie to Peter because Peter is a human person. And it makes sense to say that Ananias lied to God. When God hears God the Father, he's a person. But how do you lie to the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit is an active force and not a person? In other words, this passage proves that the parties that Ananias lied to have to be persons who have personhood, who have personality. That's what you use this passage to prove. And an eyes like to Peter. Well, Peter is a person, a human person, personhood, who can be lied to. And he lied to God the Father, whom Peter represents. Well, yeah, you can lie to God the Father because he's a person, a divine person who can be lied to. But then it says he also lied to the Holy Spirit. How do you lie to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not a person, but an active force. Okay, Pedro, I'm sorry. I didn't know what you're saying. I thought you were talking about Bob the Builder. So you see how to use Acts 5, 3 to 4, and how not to use Acts 5, verses 3 to 4? Do you see how to use it and how not to use it? You use it to prove the Holy Spirit is a person, like God the Father is a person, and the apostles are persons. Because if he wasn't a person, he can't be lied to. But they're not the same kind of person. The apostles are human persons. God the Father is a divine person. And the Holy Spirit is not human. And he's not a creature. He's not angelic. So we're left with that he must be a divine person as well. Right? And in the same chapter, speaking to Sapphira, notice what Acts 5 verse 9 says. What did Sapphira do? Because she lied like her husband Ananias lied. But catch Acts 5 verse 9. Acts 5 verse 9. Watch here. How do you lie to an active force, rider of the clouds? Do you lie to your water faucet? Do you lie to your electrical outlet? What are you talking about? Acts 5, verse 9. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Folks, only persons can be tempted, not active forces. Did you catch it? Sapphira 
tempted the spirit of the Lord. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit. These are traits of personhood. You only tempt and lie to persons. Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. You catch it there? That's how you use these passages. Do not use Acts 5, 3 to 4 to prove the Holy Spirit is called God. Because you end up proving that Peter is God. And that Peter is the Holy Spirit in the flesh. No. What Peter is saying is, you're not just lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Spirit who's speaking through me. And you're lying to God whom I represent. You're lying to the God that I am representing and speaking on behalf of. And the Holy Spirit who is empowering me to represent God. So you're lying to all of us. To me, the Spirit and God. Not because I'm the Spirit. And the Spirit is God. You're lying to all three groups. But however, the Spirit must be a person in order for you to be able to lie to Him. Just like lying to the apostles show that they're persons and lying to God the Father show that He's a person. You see the point? That's all you want to do with Acts 5. Prove He's a person. Is it clear? This is why. It's not enough, folks. Let me encourage you to simply hear your favorite preachers, teachers, apologists, and parrot their arguments. No, you got to go deeper. You got to be a Berean, Acts 17, 11. You got to do what Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, illuminate me to understand what this man is saying, what this woman is saying. Show me where they're wrong, where they're weak. Strengthen me. When they're right, and help me to go deeper for the glory of the triune God. That's what you need to do. You with me there? But what I see is people parroting arguments. And look, we all do that. I did that. That's why I'm so grateful for the triune God and his love and mercy and grace towards me that I don't deserve. And may he forgive me when I fail him and help me not to fail him to then take me to a higher level and not allow me to stay in that level of simply parroting what I heard. Because in the beginning, I used to use Acts 5, verses 3 to 4, until by the grace of God's Spirit, I realized, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. no. Let me think a little deeper about this. No, no, this proves too much. You get the point? What passages would I use to show the Holy Spirit is called God or Jehovah? Okay. What passages would I use? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Good, Dan. I know you did. That's why I'm sharing with you. But Dan, I want to encourage you. Don't simply accept everything your pastor or your favorite theologians or apologists say. Because I know that you lean towards Reformed Calvinistic ministers, which is fine. But you can't limit yourself only to that brand of Christianity or you're going to be myop myopic in your sight, in your understanding, and limited. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Only, only me what, defeat, defeat? 2 Corinthians 3, 17 18. Protestant, you keep dropping the ball. I'm going to smash you, brother. I will really sidekick you and then repent. But I love you. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Okay, now let's read. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Read. Now the Lord is that spirit. Bam, right there, baby. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Bam, right there, baby. Notice you have two who are called Lord. The Lord who is the spirit and the spirit who belongs to the Lord. Bam, that's the passage you use to show the Holy Spirit is Lord and he belongs to the Lord. Showing that one Lord is multi-personal. The Lord is the spirit and the spirit belongs to the Lord. And in context, if you start reading from 7 all the way to 18, that other Lord that the Spirit belongs to is said to be Christ. And it's a commentary on Exodus 34. Guys, let me unpack 2 Corinthians 3. You read from 7 to 18. We won't read it tonight. Paul is expounding on Moses' encounter with Jehovah, where on the mount he beheld Jehovah. And when he came down, his, his face was illuminated by the presence of God to the point that the Israelites could not look at him 
and he had to put a veil on because he beheld the glory of the Lord, the glory of Jehovah, and start reflecting the light from God's presence to such an extent that when the Israelites saw him, they couldn't look from the glorious illumination that he started reflecting from being in the presence of God. And Exodus 34 said he had to veil himself. And Paul is speaking about that encounter. He, that's the context. Don't take my word for it. Read 7 to 18 at your own leisure. And he says in that context that the veil is only removed in Christ. And so in the context, Paul says, the Lord is the spirit and the spirit belongs to the Lord. And in context, he tells us who that other Lord is. It's Christ because he says the veil is removed when you turn to Christ. The, the veil is removed when you turn to the Lord. So there, the Lord who removes the veil is said to be Christ. But then the spirit is said to be the Lord who belongs to the Lord who is Christ. Let me repeat. The spirit is identified as the Lord who belongs to the Lord who is Christ. So Christ and the spirit are identified as the one Lord Jehovah that Moses saw. Did you catch what I said? The Lord Jehovah that Moses saw in Exodus 34 is identified in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 18, specifically 12 to 18, as Christ and the Spirit. Christ and the Spirit are said to be that Lord that Moses saw. So the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit belongs to the Lord Christ. So Christ is Lord. The Spirit is Lord. Both of them are the one Lord Jehovah. That's the Trinity defeat. But be careful of Yitzhak Shapira. He's a modalist heretic. And I thank the Lord that he vanished from sight. Is that clear? That's the passage I use to show where the Spirit is said to be Jehovah. You with me there? You caught it again? That's the passage. Yeah, well... Whatever objection they have, it's not going to work because there the spirit belongs to the Lord. So he's differentiated from the Lord, but he's said to be the Lord at the same time. That's what I expect to find as a Trinitarian. But a Unitarian or Muslim would have a nightmare because how can you have the spirit being the Lord and belonging to the Lord if the Lord is not multipersonal? Everyone got that point? What passage I would use? To show that the spirit is said to be Jehovah. And it's in the context where there are two who are identified as Lord. Not two lords, not two Jehovahs. One Lord, one Jehovah. Who exists as more than one person. Christ and the spirit. Christ and the spirit. Right? The other one I like to use is 2 Samuel 23. Verses 2 to 3. 2 Samuel 23. Verses 2 to 3. Am I boring you guys with this or are you following with me? That I wouldn't use, Bill Thompson, because the second occurrence of Lord is not Jehovah, it's Adoni. So the Unitarians have a response to that. <clears throat> but here, 2, Corinthians 3, 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3. Read with me, folks. The Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of Yehovah, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me. So notice David knows the Spirit is a person who speaks and inspires him. A thousand years before Christ and Peter told us that David wrote and spoke by the Holy Spirit, David already knew this. Write this down. David is testifying because verse 1 tells us these are the words of David, his final words. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me. So the Spirit used me to speak. His word is on my tongue. So Israel... The words I'm speaking, they're not my words. They are the words of the Spirit because the Spirit is speaking by me. So wait, David, you are aware that, number one, the Spirit is a person? Yeah. He's a person who speaks and inspires me what to say. Okay. And you're also aware that the words you speak are by revelation of the Spirit? Yes. So you're testifying that you are writing by revelation of the Spirit? Yes. So you know that your words and what you write are revelations from God? Yes. 
Oh, interesting. Hmm, interesting. Now let's see verse 3. One more time. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. Okay, guys, I'm confused. I'm confused. Verse 2, David says, the spirit of Jehovah spake by me. His word was on my tongue. But then in verse 3, it says, the God of Israel spoke and the rock of Israel spake. Wait, wait, who is speaking? The spirit or God? Who's speaking? The spirit or God? BMW, please don't post verses. Thank you. Protestant is doing that. Who's speaking, folks? Did you catch 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3? No, not all three, Angela. Angela, you're killing me. Where'd you get three? When you say three, do you mean David as well? Then yeah. No, no, guys, come on. 2 Samuel 23, 2 to 3. It's right in front of you. Don't guess. If you guess, I'm going to start blocking people. Read it again. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 to 3. Read it again. Let's post it and read it again. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. So it's the Spirit speaking by the mouth of David. His word, the Spirit's word, was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. Okay, so now... Is it the spirit that spoke to and through David? And is it the word of spirit on his tongue? Or is it the God of Israel? Both and because the spirit speaks, God speaks. In other words, this is telling you that the spirit speak is the God of Israel speaking. Both and. The Spirit is God. God is the Spirit. He is the rock of Israel. So when the Spirit speaks, God speaks. That's the point. And David knew this a thousand years before Jesus Christ and Peter confirmed that David wrote and spoke by the Holy Spirit. Right? You got it? Let it sink in before I move on. Is everyone with me, right? Making sense. Yes, in Christ alone, but the modalists will tell you that's three manifestations of a single person. Because God is omnipresent and he can manifest in multiple forms, multiple ways. That's how they get around it. But in so doing, they are pretty much assaulting God's nature, blaspheming his nature, because here God is misleading us into thinking they're distinct persons when actually it's one and the same person. Dan Bitzel, you're killing me right now. You know why you're killing me? I just quoted 2 Corinthians 3 where it says the Lord is a spirit, and I just explained that the Lord there is Jehovah, and you're asking me, is the spirit ever given the name Yahweh? Where were you, Dan? Were you watching UFC or you checked out? Let's try this again, Dan. Where were you for the last 10 minutes when I broke down 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 18, to show that there it says the Lord is a spirit, and there Lord refers to Jehovah whom Moses encountered in Exodus 34, and that Lord who is a spirit is said to also belong to the Lord, showing that Christ and the spirit are called Lord, meaning Jehovah. Dan, where were you, bro? No, you didn't get me, because if you have to ask me, that means you didn't get me. So I'm, again, I'm asking, where were you, brother? I just spent 10 minutes saying, in the context, it's talking about Moses' encounter with Jehovah in Exodus 34, where from the presence of God, he started illuminating the glorious light of Jehovah to the point that the Israelites could not look at him, and he put a veil and in that context, Paul then says that Lord is the Spirit and Christ. Because the Lord is the Spirit and the Spirit belongs to the Lord, meaning the Lord Christ, identifying both as the Lord Jehovah of Exodus 34. So I don't, I'm confused why you asked me that question, brother, because either you're not paying attention, you got distracted, which is fine. I don't want to. 
you know, make you feel uncomfortable, but it actually is a disrespect to me when I make a point and I repeat myself more than once and take considerable amount of time to unpack someone, then someone comes back and asks me a question that I just finished answering. That's actually disrespect to the speaker. Right? So everyone got it? Everyone got? Then in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 18, there it says Jehovah is the Spirit, and the Spirit belongs to Jehovah. Because their Lord, in context, is referring to Jehovah that Moses saw. Right? I just want to make sure, because now I'm hesitating to move to the next point. Did everyone get that point? That you don't use Acts 5 to prove that the Holy Spirit is called God. You use Acts 5 to show the Holy Spirit is a person who can be lied to, like God the Father is a person who can be lied to, and the apostles are persons that can be lied to. That's what you use Acts 5 for. If you want to show the Holy Spirit is called God, you go to 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18. There he's said to be Lord in the sense of being Jehovah. And he belongs to the Lord, meaning he is the spirit of Jehovah. So he is Jehovah, who is the spirit of Jehovah. And that Jehovah that he's the spirit of is Christ. So 2 Corinthians identifies Christ and the spirit as Jehovah. Something amazing. Right? Is everyone getting it? Before I move on? If there's anyone confused, let me know because I don't want to move to the next point. Yep, subscribe and hit the like button. Okay, someone asked me to deal. Okay, that's okay, brother. God bless you, Dan. That's fine. Like I said, either you're distracted. That's fine, bro. I want you to be able to focus and learn. And if there's something confusing, go back and listen to it again because I want you to be the best you can possibly be for the glory of the triune God. And I'm not here to discourage you, but also at the same time, I'm not here to tickle ears. I may have to be rough sometimes. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And that's not just physical discipline. It can refer to spiritual discipline because we've been baby too long, Christians. We've been going to churches for too long that have watered down the gospel and keep giving us milk and have refused to give us meat, producing a generation of biblical illiterates. And enough is enough, especially the time is at hand. Christ's second coming is closer than ever before. He may come tonight or 100 years from now, but we need to be prepared by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to know our sword. We need to know our Bible. We need to be digging into the meat. Enough milk. Let me give you what Hebrew says as a word of exhortation and rebuke to Jews who are about to leave the faith. Hebrews 5, 11 and 14. Pay attention, especially verse 12. Hebrews 5, 11, 14. Notice what he says to these group of Jews who are about to leave Christ for the law, bringing about swift damnation and destruction. Notice what he says to them. We're talking about things, and he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. Notice he's rebuking them. Pay, please pay attention to this text section. He's rebuking them. You're dull of hearing. Even though I want to go on to more pressing issues, you're dull of hearing. You can't take it in. You can't understand it. Now notice the rebuke in 12. Notice the rebuke in 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, for now is the time that you should be teaching you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's rebuking them. By, by this time, you should have been teaching the word, but you are like children who need someone to teach you again the basics of the faith. You're still on milk when you should be eating meat. He's rebuking them. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. You see what he says? For he's a babe. If you are in milk stage, you are not qualified to be teaching the depth of God's word because you're a baby still. 
And by this time, you should have been teachers teaching the depth of God's word, but you're still on milk, unqualified to teach the word. Because now notice 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, meaning spiritually mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, he's rebuking them. He's rebuking them. By this time, you should have been teaching, but you need me to teach you again and give you milk again when you should have been on meat. And because you're on milk, you're unskillful and not qualified to be teaching the depth of God's word. You catch it? Enough of the babying, enough of the ear tickling, enough of the dumbing down and watering down of the depth and beauty of God's word. We need to go to a higher level. It is unbelievable. We live in a time, unlike any time in church history, where we have so much resources a fingertip away for free. We are flooded with such information about the background of the Bible, historically, archaeologically. Massive amount of textual evidence for the Bible. Commentaries galore. A fingertip away, and yet the level of biblical illiteracy is so alarming that this generation is more illiterate than previous generations who know more about the word, even though they didn't have the technology that we have to be super geniuses, Right? And super mature in the Word of God. Right? Enough is enough. Honestly, enough is enough. And understand one thing. I want to remind you of this. Okay? The greater the blessing, the greater the accountability, the greater the responsibility, the greater the judgment. We live at an age when we have received such blessings unheard of, and not just spiritually, not just biblically. Even when it comes to health, medicine, for example, anesthesia. Can you imagine living 100 years ago without anesthesia, needing your leg to be amputated in order to save your life so that gangrene doesn't spread to your heart and kill you dead? Can you imagine living at that time without anesthesia, having to have your leg amputated and the pain go of that? Surgery, you now live at a time where they can knock you out in a nanosecond and perform open heart surgery, whatever it is, and you awaken and you don't feel the pain to the degree that people felt it less than 100 years ago. We have been blessed with an overabundance of just medical provision, health, you name it. And the greater the blessing, the greater the accountability, the greater the responsibility, the greater the judgment. Do you know that? This generation, if the Lord comes now, will be judged and punished more severely than any other generation previously, except the generation that saw Jesus on earth in the flesh, right? Because of the overabundance of evidence Destroying any argument against Christianity. Previous generations could try to argue there's no God. But in light, in light of technology, where we can look at the DNA and see the complexity in DNA and all the information in the DNA, right, that has enough information to fill a library full of books and you still believe there's no God, you deserve the hell that you will experience on the Day of Judgment. You get my point? Yes, Stephen Baptiste, but even worse will be the generation that saw Jesus, the God-man, face-to-face, -face, God in the flesh. That generation will have it even worse. Okay. okay. With that said, I didn't mean to go on a rant. I just want to encourage you. We need to get biblical. Let me deal with John 20, 17 as the final text for tonight. And then I'll just uh, make some brief comments about my trip. And then some prayer requests. And then Lord willing, Lord willing, I'll be back in the saddle doing more live streams when I have time. Because I still need prayer that God will guide me to find the right place. If he wants me to find it sooner than later, ask God to work it out. 
God has given me favor here so far. I've been given gracious support and just favor locally to stay here. And I pray that I stay here planted for the foreseeable future. But, folks, I can be honest. Thanksgiving is around the corner, and so is Christmas, and I don't have my two angels, and I ache for them. I love them, and I pray I'll see them in Jesus' name and that God is keeping them perfectly healthy and flooding them in his love because I know they miss their Baba. But anyway, John 20, verse 17. Let's deal with that. John 20, verse 17. Okay, this is the passage I was asked to deal with. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet... Ascend unto my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. So, guys, notice it's after the resurrection. Jesus still speaks of the father as his God. Jesus still speaks of the father as his God. So, notice after the resurrection, Jesus is raised immortal. He's about to enter glory and he says, Tell my brethren, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So, the objection is, how can Jesus be God when he has a God over him, specifically the Father? Do you understand the objection? I need comfort more than ever, Rachel. Because I'll be honest, loneliness is killing me. Okay, so I was asked to deal with this passage. Okay, so are you ready for me to unpack it? Most of you know the answer already. Someone just said it, all right? Okay. <clears throat> Now, number one, let's go to Jeremiah 32, 27. Let me show you how to answer this objection. We're going to have fun because this is a passage that Muslims use that you're going to turn against Muslims. Even though Joe's Witnesses use it, it comes from Muslims thinking that they've stumped us. But now notice how it's going to turn against them to prove Muhammad is a false prophet and an antichrist. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am Jehovah the Lord. The God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? Did you catch it? The God of all flesh. Okay. The God of all flesh. John 1, 14. John 1, 14. Let's read. Watch here. John 1, 14. I hope you're not complaining that you know the answer, James Martel. I almost sound like you're angry. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us when he beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So did you catch it? The word who is not the Father, but distinct from the Father, he became flesh. The Father did not become flesh. The Holy Spirit did not become flesh. The word became flesh in order to fulfill the Father's will. John 6, 38. John 6, 38. Watch here. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Okay, did you catch it? The will okay. of him that sent me. Okay, so the word is not the Father. The Word is thing from the Father. He became flesh. The Father didn't become flesh. The Spirit didn't become flesh. The Word becomes the historical Jesus. When He becomes flesh, He is now Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus says that He came down to do the will of the Father. Okay. So if He became flesh to do the Father's will, and the Father is God, why would it surprise us that the Word who is now flesh would have the Father become his God after he became flesh. Did you catch it? Notice how it works out logically, beautifully, perfectly consistent. You see how perfectly consistent the Bible is. The Father is God. So is the Word and the Spirit. But the Word alone became flesh to fulfill the Father's will. To be the Father's servant on earth. The Father didn't become flesh. The Holy Spirit didn't become flesh. The Word became flesh to fulfill the Father's will. So why would it surprise us that when the Word becomes flesh, the Father who's God becomes the God of the Word incarnate? Does this make sense? 
I was going to address that later, Jericho. Not tonight. I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. Make sense? Okay. But then why after the resurrection is the Father still his God? Why after the resurrection is the Father still his God? Because he's still flesh. Because the resurrection means Jesus took that flesh body and made it immortal, incorruptible. It's the same flesh, but now glorified, immortalized. How do we know it's the same flesh? John 20, 24 to 27. No, even if he ascended, Grung, even in heaven, the Father still is God. Bad answer. Please, Grung, do not answer incorrectly. Please, sister, I love you. That's not the answer. Because even in heaven, he's still flesh and the Father still is God. In heaven, according to Revelation. Here's the answer. John 20, 24 to 27. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, the hands that were nailed. I want to see those hands and the, the holes. Right? If he's been raised, if he's been resurrected, that means he's been raised in that physical body that was nailed. So if it's that physical body that he's raised in, the holes will still be there. Notice his logic. Right? Notice his logic. Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So if you're telling me he's been raised, that means that flesh body that was nailed and pierced has come to life and the holes will still be in that body if he's been raised. In other words, Thomas assumed Jesus is still in his flesh body that has now been raised and made immortal. So I want to see the proof. Okay, let's see what happens. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now notice what Jesus invites Thomas to do. 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless but believing. Folks, can I ask you a question? Why? Would Jesus invite Thomas to touch the holes in his hands and the hole in his side if Jesus didn't have a body of flesh, if Jesus wasn't raised and that physical body nailed but now immortalized and glorified? What does this tell you? What does that tell you? No, no, that's, you're not answering my question, Cam. Let's try it again. Why would Jesus tell Thomas to touch the holes in his hands and his side if Jesus wasn't in his physical body of flesh that had been nailed and died and buried, but now raised and made immortal and glorious? To answer the question is to answer it because Jesus had his body of flesh. The resurrection means that the resurrection is the resurrection of that body of flesh with one difference. Now it's immortal, indestructible. It cannot die. It cannot be destroyed. You with me there? You understand now? Thank you, Stephen. To ask the question, I actually answered it by asking the question the way I did. Okay, but now if Jesus still is in the flesh after the resurrection... Why would it then surprise you that because he's still in the flesh, he's still a man, a human being with a flesh body made glorious, immortal, the father would still be his God? Thomas, that question hurts me because it shows you don't understand the passage. Who told you she didn't touch him? Why are you misreading the, uh, the passage? She was touching him. You want me there? Did everyone get it? If Jesus is thin in his flesh body, a flesh body now made immortal that cannot be destroyed, cannot die, why would it surprise you that at the resurrection, the Father still is God? In fact, understand the depth of the love of your Savior. Jesus knew to redeem you, he would have to take on a human nature, a physical body, and be bound to that physical body forever. Because he could never discard that physical body, never discard his human nature. 
bound to a second nature forever, and he gladly did so knowing he'd be bound to it forever because of his love for us to redeem us. Do you see the great depth of his love? Do you see the price he paid? A price that he knew would entail not only becoming man, not only taking on a flesh body, but being bound to that physical body and being bound to that human nature, forever having a second nature, and never being able to discard it, having a body forever and ever, and yet he says, you're worth it. Because Shamir, if he cast it aside, then that means he did not pay the penalty of our debt because the debt of sin is death. To show that he paid our debt and now the debt has been canceled and the, the, the sting of sin has been destroyed, he'd have to rise from the dead as proof. You see, I've abolished human death and here's the proof that I've abolished it I have been raised in that physical body as proof. Your debt is paid. Death has been destroyed. Sin has no power over you. Sunan, you guys are killing me. He did not say, don't touch me. You're misreading what it means. Let's try it again. John 20, 17. John 20, 17. Okay. Let me explain to you what it's actually saying. Yeah, let's try it. Let's, let me explain it to you. Okay. Jesus said to her, touch me not. Now, you're, you're reading it to mean that she's not touching him. No. If you actually get any good commentary, touch me not means stop touching me because she is already touching him. She threw herself at him and was clinging to him. This is why you need a good commentary to bring out the import of the text. I'm not trying to improve on the King James. Don't, don't, that's not what I'm trying. But sometimes you have to read a little deeper to understand the implication of these words. Touch me not can mean don't get near me. Or after you're touching me, I can say, hey, man, touch me not, right? You with me there? Even in Old English, touch me not can mean don't touch me at all. Or after you touch me, hey, stop touching me. Touch me not. Let me ask you a question. If she wasn't already touching him, why even tell her, touch me not? She hadn't even touched him. So why are you saying, touch me not? Because even in that response, it shows she was touching him. You see why I keep saying you got to read deeper, not surface level. If she's not touching him, there's no need for him to say, touch me not. You get it? The fact that he says, touch me not, assume she's touching him. That's why other translations will say, stop touching me or stop clinging to me. So what's Jesus' point here? Jesus' point is to encourage her. Why was she touching him? Because she was holding on to him for dear life. Earlier in the context, she had thought someone had stolen the body and she was weeping, showing how much love she had for Jesus. She even said, where have you taken him? Let me know and I will go and bring back the body of my Lord. Did you see her love? Even in death, he was still her Lord. Even in death, she still loved him to the point saying, tell me where you put the body and I'll bring it back. And then Jesus says to her, woman, why do you weep? Why weepest thou? Right? And then she explains it. And then he, he says, Mary, and she recognized his voice. So it says she turned to look at him, and she goes, Rabboni, and out of excitement, she dove at him, and he's saying, stop touching me, not to insult her or berate her, to encourage her, because now she's holding on for dear life, saying, you're never going to leave me again. You're going nowhere. And Jesus is assuring her, you don't need to cling to me. I've yet to send to my father. In other words, what he's saying here is, Mary, you don't need to worry. You'll see me again. I have yet to send to my father. So this is not the last time you'll see me. So don't panic. You understand? He's comforting her. You don't need to cling to me desperately, Mary. I'm not leaving you yet. I've yet gone to the father. 
you will see me again. So now in the meantime, run to my brothers and tell them that my destiny ultimately will be to return to my father. You understand the context now? That's the context. Is it making sense? So even that response, touch me not, assume she's touching him. So then why does he say eight days later, Thomas, touch me? Because there it's a different context. Mary is clinging to him for life, doesn't want to let him go. So he's encouraging her. You don't need to cling to me so desperately, Mary. I've yet gone to heaven. So you'll see me again. This is not the last time. Don't panic. Don't be afraid. Mary, you'll see me again. Let your heart be at ease. Right? Thomas, it's a different point. He wanted proof that Jesus has been raised in that body. Here's the proof. Touch me. I like how Groen put it. <laughs> I like how you put it. God bless you, medic. You can listen, listen to the rest of it later. Is it making sense to everyone? That Jesus is not telling her, you can't touch me. But he's encouraging her, you don't need to cling to me so desperately. You don't need to hold on to me so tightly, Mary. He's giving her assurance. This isn't the last time. Let your heart be at ease. Because if you go to Matthew 28, 9, Matthew 28, 9, that same Sunday, that same resurrection day, the same day, Jesus allowed the woman to touch his feet and worship him. Matthew 28, verse 9. No, Jericho, that's not the meaning. Don't ever misquote the text. That's not why he told her, don't touch me, because he'd be richly unclean. Because if a woman touched him, he couldn't present himself to heaven. No, that's not the interpretation. That's the misinterpretation by popular preachers that you bought into. No, that's not the reason. Because Matthew 28, 9 says you just destroyed Jesus' ritual purity, Jericho. Because Matthew 28, 9, the women were touching his feet. Read it, Matthew 28, 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet. Jericho, you just destroyed Jesus' ritual purity because you are parroting what some evangelist taught you. That's not the reason why. And it's not your fault. Did you read Matthew 28, 9? They held him by his feet. According to you, Jericho, the woman defiled Jesus. He wasn't ritually clean. Therefore, he couldn't present himself to the Father. Where are you getting these things from? The traditions of Protestant preachers. Yes. I heard an apologist say that in his debate with Ahmad Didat. You know who said that? The first time I heard it and I bought into it. You know who? It was this debate with Ahmad Didat, which you can hear online. You know who? Folks, you want me to shock you? Josh McDowell. In his debate with Ahmad Didat, which you can hear online in the 80s, he said he wouldn't allow Mary to touch him because he had to present himself to the Father in heaven. Wrong. Because let's read Matthew 28, 9. If you don't believe the Gospels contradict Matthew 28, verse 9, let's read it one more time. So Jericho, please don't parrot everything you hear. Read it. This is the first Resurrection Sunday before Jesus has ascended. Same Sunday that Mary clung to him. Read Matthew 28, 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So according to you, Jericho, because the woman touched his feet, he became ritually unclean. You caught it? You see how many traditions we bought into that are unbiblical, folks? You see how many traditions we bought into that are unbiblical? So why is he telling Mary... Stop clinging to me because he's comforting her. God bless you, Dan. Keep praying for me. 
to walk in holiness and purity and be a doer of the word and to honor Jesus. Okay. He's comforting her. She's clinging to him for dear life. He's saying, rest at ease, Mary. You don't need to keep clinging to me tightly because I've yet left the earth to return to heaven and won't return again until the end of the age. You'll see me again. I'll be here. And then John shows that he appeared to the disciples on other occasions, right? Yep, Josh McDowell. And so you don't take my word for it, Thomas Hill. Listen to his debate. It's online. Ahmadi Dot, Josh McDowell, he says it. And when I first heard it, I thought it was neat and started parroting it. This is why you got to pray for me and one another. The Holy Spirit convict us to see where we're wrong or where a preacher is wrong, not repeat those mistakes and perfect our understanding of Scripture and live it for the glory of Christ. And that's not putting Josh down. No human teacher interprets the Bible perfectly. But you understand now why Jesus said what he said to Mary? Did we get that? Is that clear? It's not simply bowing down to the feet, Katie. It says they held his feet. They held them by the feet, so they touched his feet. And Jesus didn't say, don't touch me. Stop touching me. Okay. So not to lose the point, let's come back. Is it clear in John, after the resurrection, Jesus was in his body of flesh with all the holes from the crucifixion and the beating, but that body and flesh he now raised immortal, glorious, so that it could never be destroyed or die again. Was that clear? Was that clear? Did we get that point? Let's not forget the point. So if Jesus is still in his flesh after the resurrection, and the Father is the God of all flesh, and Jesus the Word became flesh, why would it shock you the Father becomes Jesus' God and remains Jesus' God after the resurrection when Jesus still remains in the flesh? Why would that be a problem to us? John 20, 17. Is that a problem? Or should we expect that Jesus, who's still in the flesh, a man, would still honor the Father as his God? He's my Father. He's my God. Because as God, I'm his Son. As man, he's my, my God. Because I'm still God and man. Right? Clear? Is that clear, though? Okay, now, it gets even more problematic, though. For the Muslim and the anti-Trinitarian. If a Muslim uses it, say, if a Muslim uses John 20, 17, you see what you tell them. Say, thank you again for proving that Muhammad is an antichrist, a false prophet. Why? Because Jesus said his God is his father and the father of all believers. But Muhammad's God is a father to no one. So if I am to believe John 20, 17, I have to now condemn Muhammad as an antichrist, a false prophet, because he contradicted this very verse you're using against me. Jesus said, my father and my God, the disciples' father and their God. So the God of Jesus and the God of disciples is the father of Jesus, the father of disciples, and Muhammad's God is a father to no one. So thank you for quoting Jesus to condemn Muhammad as an agent of Satan and antichrist. You see how you turn it against the Muslim? You see how you turn it against the Muslim? Oh, but we're not done yet. A few more minutes. I know we took too long. I don't want to do two-hour sessions. I want to keep a little less because people complain. It's too long, brother. But you'll watch a two-hour movie, but you won't listen to a two-hour session. All right, fine. Okay. But now, John 20, 22. John 20, 22. Watch this. It's going to get even better, folks. Going to be blown away. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Wait, 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 wait. <whistles> Jesus does what the Old Testament says only God does. Breathe the Holy Ghost on believers. Jesus breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. I challenge a Muslim and a Unitarian to show me a single place in the Hebrew Bible, a single place in the Old Testament, where someone 
other than God breathes the Holy Spirit on anyone. I challenge, challenge a Muslim Unitarian to quote a single passage from the Hebrew Scriptures where someone other than Jehovah breathes the Holy Spirit. So you're telling me that very same chapter, which you're using to prove Jesus isn't God, shows that Jesus does what only God can do, such as breathe out the Holy Spirit to give spiritual life upon his followers? Really? Finally, finally, John 20, 28 to 29. John 20, 28 to 29. Finally. And Thomas answered and said unto him, pay attention. The Greek, and I'm not trying to impress you with the uh, Greek, it's ipen auto, him, not to someone else, him, addressing him, my Lord and my God, bam. The same chapter where Jesus says, God, the Father is his God, and the God of the disciples, is the same chapter where Thomas worships Jesus as his Lord and his God. And then notice what Jesus did not say. Jesus saith unto him, no, Thomas, don't say that. Don't you know the Father alone is your God? No, notice what he says. I owe, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Wait, 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 wait. In the same chapter of John 20, Jesus does what only God does according to the Old Testament. Breathe out the Holy Spirit. Breathes spiritual life. Breathes forth the Holy Spirit. Meaning the Holy Spirit is a part of him. Flows from him like it does the Father. Something the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone. And then later on, one of his followers worships him by calling him my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him and says, you have to see me to believe that? Blessed are those who don't see me and believe that. Believe what? I am their Lord and their God. But wait, I thought you just said, Jesus, the Father is the God of your followers. Yes. And you're not the Father. No, I'm not the Father. But now Thomas said, you too are his God. Yes. But according to the Old Testament, an Israelite has only one God, Jehovah. He doesn't have two gods or three gods. He has only one God, only one Lord and God, Jehovah. And yet you just said the Father is the God of Thomas, as he's the God of all his all the followers. And yet Thomas said you're his God as well, and you accepted that profession of faith. But you're not the Father. But an Israelite can only have one God, who is Jehovah. So are you telling me that you, with the Father, are the one God, Jehovah, which is why Thomas can say that you too are his God as well and not just the Father, even though he cannot have more than one God and you're not the same person as the Father. The Father and you are distinct persons, but both of you together are the God of all believers. Yes, exactly. Is that why we became Trinitarians, Jesus? Exactly. Ah, but now let's compare John 20, 28 with Psalm 35, 23. Okay, Kurgis, obviously you didn't pay attention to a single thing I said. Which part of the words Ipen Auto said to him wasn't clear? He said it to him. Which part wasn't clear, Kurgis? Because I just spent time explaining to you that he sang it directly to Jesus, not to another. And you're asking me that question? Kurgis, which part of... And Thomas answered and said to him, Auto, him, meaning he directed it to him, wasn't clear. The two or the him, Gorgias. Okay, so if you know what you're saying, why would you ask me the question? Now, I'm pronouncing the Greek as an Erasmian, or someone studying the Erasmian pr pronunciation of Greek would, would pronounce it. Ipen auto. Which part of auto, him, him, wasn't clear, Gorgias? So are you going to say it's an expression when he's saying it to him? Saying it to him, just like when it says Jesus. Now let's look at 20, 28, 29 again. This is why you guys got to pay attention and do a better job paying attention because you're going to save me time on repeating the same point. 
Gorgias, which part of the English wasn't clear when it said said to him? See, I'm, I'm really tempted to bounce you, brother, because now it's, it's getting stupid and ridiculous and nonsense. I think I'm going to have to block you, brother, because you're obviously not paying attention. Let's try it again. Let's look at John 20, 28 to 29. Which part of the English wasn't clear? Watch here, John 20, 28 to 29, one more time. See, if you guys are not paying attention, we're going to drag these discussions, making them longer than they need to be. Watch here. And Thomas answered, said unto him, unto him, which part of the English wasn't clear, clear Gorgias? You say you know the Greek. The Greek wasn't good enough. You went to the English. Now the English is not good enough. Which part is not clear? Why didn't you see 10 minutes earlier? Were you wasting my time? Now, folks, the second part, would anyone deny, 29, when it says, Jesus saith unto him, would anyone deny that in 29, Jesus is speaking to Thomas directly when it says, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, you've seen him believe? So no one would deny that that phrase, unto him, auto, means he's speaking to Thomas directly. Then why in 28, when it says that Thomas answered and said unto him, him, he's no longer speaking directly to Jesus. But he's super fluent in Greek, Andrew. The Greek is inescapable. He's speaking directly to Jesus. Right? Did everyone get that the context? You cannot, you cannot get around the context that Thomas is speaking directly to Jesus. And he's directing his praise to Jesus. He's saying these things to Jesus like Jesus then spoke directly to Thomas. There's a dog here. Let me muzzle him. Hold on. Clear? Everyone clear before I move on to the next point? Because we took longer than normal on this. And people are going to say, your sessions are too long. That's why we don't listen to you. Why can't you be like David Wood? All right. Well, what do you want me to do? Okay, yeah, here it is. Kai Apekrithi. I'm going to try to pronounce it the Greek way. Ki Apekrithi Tomas ke apen autu. Kuriasmu or kuriasmu kai oteasmu. I'm trying to learn how the Greeks pronounce it. Okay? Do you catch it? Okay. Now, growing, post the Greek one more time. Post the Greek one more time. Okay. Because I want you to catch something here in the Greek. In the Greek. Watch here. Because I'm going to show you a parallel. Okay? She posted it, right? Notice, but if it's in Greek, you probably won't notice it. It's, oh, kuriasmu kai hotheasmu. That's the Erasmian way of saying it. A Greek speaker would say, O kiriusmu, ke o theusmu. O kiriusmu, ke o theusmu. That's how a Greek speaker would say it. Anyway, do you see the expression, O kuriasmu, kai o theasmu? Okay, you see it there? Literally, it's the Lord of me and the God of me. He doesn't just say, My Lord and my God. He says, The Lord of me and the God of me. Okay. You caught it? Thomas said to Jesus, the Lord of me and the God of me. You are the Lord of me. You are the God of me. You see it? Because Psalm 35, 23. Watch Psalm 35, 23. Watch where you're going to get blown away. Psalm 35, 23. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. My God and my Lord. Wow. Did you know, if you read the Greek version, the Greek version of Psalm 35, 23, which in the Greek is Psalm 34, 23, you know what the Greek has? It's o theosmu or o theosmu ke o kuriosmu, kuriosmu, o kuriosmu, right? So in the Greek, it's the same expression, but the words are reversed. 
In the Greek of Psalm 35, it's o theosmu or o theosmu ke o kiriosmu. O theosmu ke o kiriosmu. <laughs> but uh, let me say it the Erasmian way. In the Greek, it's ha theosmu kai ha kuriosmu. And David is saying it to Jehovah. We have the exact same expression, but the words are reversed. Thomas says to Jesus, O kuriasmu kai ho theosmu. They're both using the same expression, but the words are reversed. One says, the God of me and the Lord of me. The other one says, the Lord of me and the God of me. But it means the same thing. And David is saying it to Jehovah. He's saying, Jehovah, you are the God of me and the Lord of me. But Thomas is saying it to Jesus. You're the Lord of me and the God of me. No Israelite, no monotheist could say that of any other deity except to Jehovah. Thomas says it to Jesus. You, Jesus, are the Lord of me and the God of me. But wait, Thomas, you're a Jew. You're steeped in the Old Testament. So are you, Jesus. That phrase can only be used for Jehovah. Why then are you saying it to Jesus? And why, Jesus, are you accepting it if you're not Jehovah? And you just got done telling us that the Father is their God. How can you be their God too when you're not the Father and no Israelite can have more than one God? What's the answer? Because Jesus is saying, yes, the Father is their God because he is Jehovah. But so am I. I am Jehovah too, and I too am their God, and I'm not the Father. The Father is not me. I'm not the Father. We're two eternal relationships, two distinct persons, but together we are Jehovah God, and that's all in the same chapter, John 20. All in the same chapter. Same chapter. How then do you quote verse 17, ignore verse 22, and ignore verse 28? How do you do that? You ignore verse 22, verse 28, and just focus on 17. And if it's a Muslim, shame on you, Muslim, for quoting John 20, when not only it shows that Jesus is God, one with the Father, which is why he can breathe out the Holy Spirit, something the Old Testament and the Quran agree only God can do. But it's all in the context of Jesus's physical bodily resurrection after being killed on the cross, all of which you deny. And this is the chapter that you Muslims are quoting to disprove Christianity and prove Muhammad is a prophet, a chapter that affirms Jesus's physical bodily resurrection to mortality after being killed on the cross. That's the chapter you're going to quote to convince me Islam is true? Are you kidding me? Finally, we're done. And to, Lord will now probably do tomorrow, part two tomorrow. Let's look at John 20, 17 one more time. One more time and I'm done. Let's finish it. Opinion, you know I'm going to send you on your merry way, right? John 20, 17. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but to go to my brethren and say unto them, I send to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. You know, Jesus could have simply said, I'm ascending to our Father and to our God. But you notice he didn't say that. He made it longer. He says, my Father and your Father and my God, your God. Do you know? Did you notice that? That he could have simply said, I'm ascending to our Father and our God, but he deliberately didn't say that. Do you know why? Because implicit in that distinction is the fact that Jesus' relationship to God is different from our relationship to God. He's saying, yes, he's your Father, but he's my Father in a special sense. And yes, he's your God, but he's my God in a special sense. In other words, my father has become your father because I am the essential son of God. He truly is my father, whereas he's your father because of my grace. And yes, he is your God by nature because you're creatures, whereas he's my God by choice. I chose to become flesh. I chose to become part of creation. So I chose to make him my God, whereas he is your God by nature because you're creatures. 
He is my God by choice. Whereas he is my father by nature. He's your, your father by grace. Did you catch it? He is my father by nature because I am the essential son of God. But he is your father by grace, my grace. He is your God by nature because you are creatures. But he is my God by choice because I chose to become flesh and enter the world and take on the nature of a creature. So he is my God by choice. He is your God by nature. He is my father by nature. He is your father by grace. My grace bestowed on you. See that? Catch it? Can I repeat that one more time? He is your God by nature, but he is my God by choice. Because I chose to become flesh, enter the world, and take on the nature of a creature. But you are creatures by nature. You had no choice. You were created to be human creatures. And therefore, by necessity, he's your God. He is your God by nature. He is my God by choice. He is my father by nature, but he's your father because of my grace. John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. Sink it in. You see the depth, the beauty, the majesty of the scriptures, how deep these scriptures are. If by the Holy Spirit illuminating us, we plumb the depths of it. Here's the point confirming what I said. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, he gave you the authority to be children of God. So you are, right? You are his sons because of my grace. He's your father because of my grace, where he's my father by nature. He is your God by nature, but he is my God by choice. That's why he could have simply said, I'm ascending to my, our father and our God. No, no, no. He made it complicated. I'm going to my father, who is your father, to my God, who is your God. He's my father by nature, your father by, by grace, my grace bestowed on you. And he is your God by nature, but he is my God by choice. You got it? I'm done with this. So let me let me just make one comment, and Lord will I be on tomorrow, just to blow your minds away even more by, about Jesus. As God, pay attention here. I love to say this because it's mind-blowing. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. Pay attention. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. Uh, Protestant, can you block opinion and send them out of here? I don't want them here. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, he has a mother, no father. Let me repeat it again. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, he has a mother, no father. As God, God is his father. As man, Mary is his mother. He has no human father that sired him, and he has no goddess that birthed him. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, he has a mother, no father. Amazing, isn't it? Two natures. And yet, in respect to both natures, he only has one quote-unquote parent. As God, he has a father, no mother. As man, human, he has a mother, no father. And you tell me he's not amazing? Right? You tell me he's not amazing? Now, that said, I'll give you more details about my trip to San Diego. Thank you again for your support. Honestly, I say this from my heart. If it was not for your financial support, I would not be able to do ministry, especially because we have corrupt courts and judges hounding me. And because of your support, I'm able to get books to do further research like this one. So I want to praise the Chime God for his grace and moving you to love me and support me. And I thank you and may the Lord Jesus bless you. Keep praying for me in the ministry. Keep praying for my health. Keep praying for me to get holy and not be a hypocrite, to truly lo love Jesus and obey him, to be holy. Overcome my struggles, especially loneliness. Pray for the support, right? The reason why I don't enable Super Chats Air, Ch Air Church is because I was told they take 30% of the proceeds. I'm a little greedy. I need every penny because I'm going through a battle. So thank you for your support. You can support me on PayPal, one-time gift, or Patreon. 
Pray for the support to continue to come in. Pray that I am debt-free, only indebted to Jesus. Pray for my daughters. Folks, it's going to be a hard season for me. Thanksgiving is around the corner and Christmas, and I don't have my daughters. And I miss them, and I ache them, and I know they ache for me. I'm dying to see them again. I love those girls. Pray for them. God bless them and protect them and remind them I love them and to trust they will be in my life sooner than later. And folks, November 20th, that court decision has been moved to the second week of December. I'm still not out of the woodworks. I need God to show up to deal with this corrupt legal decision to set me free and silence this wicked judge and rebuke her to get her off my back so I can focus on the Lord and stay here and just grow. So, guys, it's now the second week of December. Though it's been prolonged, the agony of not knowing the decision is still there. I need deliverance. Folks, I'm tired. I'm tired of a corrupt, wicked, filthy judge, an agent of Satan, trying to punish me illegally. And I'm tired of being alone without my daughters. I really am tired. Right? In fact, after I came back from the conference, every time I do something big, whether go to a conference or teach or debate, I get attacked with a mild form of depression. So for this past week, I was kind of depressed. I'm getting out of that rut. I need Jesus to show up in a miraculous way. I don't deserve it, but I need him and my daughters need him. Please pray God silences this wicked judge and muzzles this agent of Satan and gets her out of my life and fights for me and my daughters that I can continue to glorify him, love him, live for him, teach, both here online and locally. Because I'm looking for a place locally to do Bible studies. Can you pray for that? And do pray for the support. I hope you're blessed. Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. God willing. Pray for that. Pray for favor wherever I go. Just like he favored Joseph, pray for favor. That God will turn hearts favorably towards me, not against me. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And he is God Almighty in the flesh. One with the Father and the Spirit. Worthy of all love, worship, and praise. Lord Jesus, forgive us, please. Save us from our flesh. Save us from the world. Save us from Satan. Empower us to love you and worship you and live for you and even die for you if necessary. And fight for us, Lord. And fight for my children, please, Lord. And thank you for using me in the lives of these <clears throat> brothers and sisters who love you. Bless them, Lord Jesus. They love you. That's why they're here. Not for me, because they trust you're using me to glorify you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Please forgive us and be patient with us. In Jesus' name. Lord willing, see you tomorrow, folks. Christ is risen, risen indeed.